Well, a very good morning to all of you. Uh, we thank God that he has given us another opportunity to travel here and be with all of you, to fellowship with you and to partake and participate in your life and your life events. Uh, we just thank God for that. With that, I bring greetings from uh, my mom, Mr. Moses, then Dr. Singh uh, and Sheba. They send their big hello to all of you, followed by uh, Auntie Elizabeth. Uh, she looks forward to see you all. Then the Matthews, Mr. and Mrs. Matthews with their children, Bobby, Benny, and Betty. Benny might travel uh, tomorrow to be with us uh, on Sunday as well. Uh, and then I bring also greetings from uh, Surya Murthy and Mr. and Mrs. Nagar. So from the North Church, a big greetings to all of you. Yeah. So with that, let's uh, jump right into our message uh, today. So on the way to the village of Caesarea Philippi, Jesus asked his disciples, who do you say, who do people say that I am? To that, the disciples answered, John the Baptist. Some said, Elijah. And others, other prophets. And then he goes a little more personal with them. And he says, who do you say that I am? Now, Peter answered what probably others were afraid to answer. Peter said, you are the Messiah. And of course, they have seen him cast out demons, heal the sick, feeding the 5,000, walking on the water. It was very obvious. Peter knew this is the man that God has sent to rescue us. To Peter, Jesus was the Messiah. Now today on this holy day of Good Friday, if I have to ask you, who do you say Jesus is? What would be your answer? There are no right wrong, or not wrong answers. Okay. Who do you think Jesus is? Savior, Creator, the Lord, Redeemer, Son of God, Friend. Right. You see, in 1986, the result of one of the most uh, thorough poll about the person of the Jesus Christ, America's perception of the person of Jesus Christ, was published in the book, Who? Do Americans say that I am? You know, and this survey was conducted by an organization called Gallup, and they poll across the cross section of people, asking them about the person of Jesus Christ, uh, whether they saw him as God, whether they saw him as merely human, or they even believed if he existed or not. So the respondent were given six questions, and out of those six questions, they had to choose one of them. Let's see the results. So you can see that approximately 42% said he was divine in the sense that he was God living among humans. Well, around 27% said he was only a man. About 9% says he said divine in the sense that he's the best that is in all human. He was the best of the human being, about 9%. Then about 6% said he was a good teacher, but they were not sure whether he was divine. His divinity, they doubted. That was about 6%. About 2% says we really don't know whether there was such a person called Jesus. And a whopping 14% said they have no opinion. That was America in 1986. Well, just going back to our story now into the life of Peter and other disciples. You see, Peter was not wrong when he answered Jesus that you are the Messiah. He was not wrong. It was his interpretation of what the Messiah would or should do that was not correct. That was not correct. And that you would see as you read along after uh, this in the book of Mark, you would see how... Peter and other disciples had different interpretation of what a Messiah is. They all had a wrong 
expectation of the Messiah. They all. And in some way, the problem is with us also when it comes to interpreting who Jesus is. Now the Bible reveals that God has made humanity in his own image. However, since the fall, the humanity is busy in making God in their own image. And I'll tell you, sometimes we build God in the image of our opinion, in the image of our perception, in our beliefs. Sometimes we want him to do exactly what we want him to do. If you take out some time and just sit and, and dwell on this subject, you would realize that we have made a very limited image of God based on our understanding and perception. It's very limited. You know, sometimes we want him only to be a healer. Sometimes we want him to be a problem solver. Sometimes we want him to be a deliverer of the things that we have handed over to him. You see, not even all. All we have. So in a way, one way or another way, we have made God some sort of genie whom we ask him to do exactly what we want him to do. That's our limited version of God. Unfortunately, this does not work. This does not work because we are created to follow him, not the other way around. And this is why one of the most important questions for any person to answer is, who is God? And the answer to this question, everything else depends on it. Every aspect of our life depends on who is this God. Now, Jesus, the, Jesus asking this question, who do you think I am, is like, what kind of leader do you think I am? Where do you think I am leading you to? Or, why are you following me? What do you hope to get out of it? In short, he might ask, if you really know where I am going and the path I am going to take, are you still willing to follow me? That was his intention behind asking him, who do you think I am? With that in mind, Jesus was asking, he wanted to teach them the importance of correctly identifying the Son of God. And by identifying correctly the Son of God, he wanted to teach the disciple what it is to be the disciples of Christ. That was his main intention. The teaching was very much needed because none of the disciples had the correct expectation about the Messiah. And almost after 2000 years later, the question is still very much valid in our lives to be his disciples. We need to correctly identify Jesus, God, as revealed in Jesus, so that by the help of the Holy Spirit, we might become the disciple which he wanted us to be. We need to identify. Now, some of you might be wondering, on this holy day of a Good Friday, what sort of question is this? Do we not know who Christ is seeing at the cross? Do we not know why we are all here? And to that, the answer is perhaps yes and perhaps no. Now, I'm saying perhaps no, because if we have the right picture of God as revealed in Jesus, then we'll also understand the indicatives of his grace. What is his grace about? And uh, understanding that grace, it would produce a transformed life in us. It will produce a transformed life in us so that we are no more bogged down with our... I've swallowed a uh, slide. So that we, more, we are no more bogged down by the worldly things in our life. Now you want to know what are the worldly things in our life? Our failures. I think sometimes we give our failures too much of our importance. Now they are, by all means, they are failures. Okay, that's the reality of it. But sometimes we go too much to, to associate our failure with our identity or with our circumstantial impact. I'll tell you. Oh, my failure is because of 
what my neighbor would think. My failure is what my colleagues will think. My failure is what my church would think. You know, we, we, we exaggerate the impact based on our own understanding. We give it unnecessary too much of an importance and focus. The same happens with our success. Sometimes we take success too much on our own capabilities, on our own our ab abilities, that it converts it into pride and ego. You see, it, it focus goes somewhere else. Then our material possessions. I think we spend too much of our time, focus and energy to, to gain material possession be, because of the uncalled comparison either with our neighbor, either with our society or with somebody else. I mean, just look at it. All the things that we really want to have in our home or in our life, is it really we want or because somebody else has? has? I mean, what's wrong with my car, but I still want a better car. It works perfectly fine. And that's the thing. Then the next is our pains, our losses and our sickness. Now, they are very real, but sometimes we love to make a pity party of ourselves. Oh my goodness, my failure, I tell you, my life has been failure. Everything has been failure. No thing, this thing. We make failure and our sicknesses are a pain as if they are the topmost thing. Now, they are real. The pain is real. I am not saying that. But sometimes we give too much of a focus, too much of importance. Now, what do I mean that if we know God correctly, do I mean we would not go through any of these responses? No, I don't mean that. But if the point I am trying to make that if we know God or if we know Jesus who is a revealer, the Jesus who has revealed the very nature and heart of God. He, Jesus, who is a redeemer, the one who had no sin in him, went on cross carrying our sin, entire humanity. He is our atonement. In him, he lifted the entire humanity towards God through him by the Spirit. He is our atonement. He is a giver of our new life. He has given an access to and communion with God. An uninterrupted communion with God. Yeah. He is our intercessor. He allows us. He takes up our matter to God. He represents us. He is the eternal promise keeper. In him, we have a promise of eternal life. He is our salvation. You and I don't earn this salvation. You and I don't live for this salvation. This is a gift. And what do we know when we know Jesus who is our revealer, redeemer, our atonement, our giver of new life, our intercessor, our eternal promise keeper, our salvation? If we know who he is, then our response to our life situation would be much different. It would be much different. And let's unbox this idea of how our response to our life situation would be different if we know God who is revealed in Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus mostly spoke in parables. And we will use the verses that Roshan read today to unpack this uh, concept. So, Jesus mostly spoke in parables and those parables were not always so easy and direct to interpret. But here we see in verse 31 and 32, Jesus spoke very plainly and clearly about his death and resurrection. He spoke very plainly. Hearing this, Peter was surprised and shocked because just now he declared Jesus to be Messiah and now his Messiah is saying that he must suffer and die. The concept of a failed Messiah didn't go well with Peter. And there is a reason to that. Because the identity of a disciple is closely tied up with the identity of the master. And after seeing his master do wonders, healing, walking on the water, feeding so many people, their expectation was right that this Messiah would restore the rightful kingdom of Jews. And stop the persecution by the Roman Empire. It was a very natural reaction for Peter 
because of their expectation of Messiah. Isn't it the case also with us when we unable to see our Messiah intervene and change our life situation? When we see our pain continues, when we see our grief continues, our sorrow continues, our suffering continues, our losses continues, we also struggle like Peter struggled. We also question the ability of Messiah, especially we praise him with the highest honor, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. But yet, when the things are same, we question. And Jesus knows this. He knows this in today's time and he knew that his disciple also need to have correct lenses to see who is Jesus. The lesson Jesus wanted to teach Peter was needed by everyone. And then we see, then he called the crowd along with his disciple and said, and today he is calling all of us. He said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Now, what does he mean to deny themselves and take up the cross? I mean, in today's context, what does he mean? Well, Jesus is saying, if you want to learn from me and follow me, then you must be ready to put aside your expectation of life, to put aside your relationship, to put aside your circumstances as per the standards of this society. He expects you to put aside and then follow him. We must be ready to give the lordship of our life into the hand of Jesus. To such a level that even if we have to sacrifice our life to him, that's the level of dedication he wants us to. But does that mean we give up everything and give every our dream and expectation? No, it, he does not mean that. He certainly does not mean that. But what does he then mean? So let's see further in verse 35 to 37. Yeah. Jesus wants us to focus on the aim of our life, about the lordship of our lives, which is in his hand. Jesus is very clear that if we get bogged down with the affairs and things of our life, to that extent that that thing become the priority of our life instead of Jesus, then those things become our Lord instead of Jesus. If the pressure of a job is taking you too much, is taking you aside from your time with God, with your family, with your friend, then job is your Lord. If the family responsibilities are taking you up, apart from that, then they have unfortunately become the Lord of your life. Now, what happens when something takes over our lordship from Jesus? We break our communion with God to the level that we miss the pure joy, hope, love, peace that only comes from him. We break that very communion with him. And what happened? Then we put ourselves into the pit of darkness and the devil take controls of our life. Then we go into pain, we go into suffering, and we still struggle where things are going wrong. You know, sometimes we humans are also too much focused on our present circumstances. We are too much bogged down about the results that we see the big pictures, what is lying ahead. And the disciples did the same. Peter also did the same. Peter heard partially what Jesus was saying about his death and resurrection. He totally forgot the part where Jesus said uh, of rising after three days. He just heard that uh, his Messiah going to die, but he didn't bother to listen to the rest of it. You know, the disciples forgot that their Messiah is much bigger than their expectation of being the military ruler. Because if Jesus promises eternal life, then he must conquer death itself. And this can be only be done by someone who pass into that and come out victorious from the other side. And we all need such Messiah who dies and return to life. 
And my dear family, Jesus has done that for us. Jesus has done that for us. And that is why on this side of the cross, after 2000 years, we are no more sitting in front of the cross, sadly, not knowing what's going to happen as the situation was with his disciple and the other people's then. Because we know what has happened. He has conquered death once and for all. And through his work on the cross, he has redeemed humanity. We know that. And since we know that, we know, we know that we should also allow our life to be transformed so that we can be his disciples. Those disciples had that evening, somehow due to their limitation of thinking, had a limited picture. But to you and me, the picture is complete. On this side of the cro cross, we know what happened later. Yeah? So how do we transform our life? Now, the first disciples and the follower of Christ, they used to closely follow Christ's life and then they used to replicate that model into their life. But if you see in today's time, Jesus is more than physically present with us than he was almost 2000 years ago. Because through his Holy Spirit, Christ now reside within those who believe in God and follow him. His very presence resides in us. And that's why when the songs were going, I could see partial of my sermon flowing. Yet not I, but Christ in me. Yeah? And that's exactly what Apostle Paul said. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer, uh, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. Then if we follow Jesus Christ, then he enters our life, transforming us unto a new man and woman. Our life has to be transformed. The presence of Jesus in our life shows that our life needs has to be transformed. But that's also the point when the struggle begins. You know how? Because the sinful self does not want to die. Our sinful self does not want to die. Yet Christ urges us to follow him unto the death of the cross. Now, Jesus' intent is that we be conformed to his death. What does he mean? Not necessary in literal sense, but anyone following Christ will be crucifying his, her, her, her own sinful desires. On the cross, we need to crucify the sin. We need to crucify our sinful desires. For us, the words follow me means we die daily to a temptation that lead us away from Christ. Yeah, when Jesus says follow me, he is saying we die daily to our temptation that lead us away from Christ. Ours is the daily sacrifice of the sinful self on the cross of Christ. You see, but Sin violates and deforms the life of Christ dwelling in us. Sin in us violates the very communion, the very presence of Christ that is dwelling in us. Now through the spirit of God in us, we can crucify and put sin to death. Not by our own self, but through Christ, through his spirit. And in that way we are truly alive spiritually. You know, we may... In, in, in that whole process, you may experience pain, anger, suffering, you know, it losses. But they are not waste because when we die with Christ, we are led to a very new place of freedom. And in the whole process, we do more than following Christ. What happened? We become Christ-like. No more just a follower, we become Christ-like. And that's through God's Holy Spirit, which is also the Spirit of Christ who has remolded us, remodeled us spiritually. And we are reborn from above. And if we live our life by the faith of the Son of God in us, then we are a new creation. We are a new creation, as Apostle Paul says in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. So, 
my dear family, we have to look to Jesus to define God for us and resist every temptation to view God through the lens of our biases, through the lens of our perceptions, through the lens of our perspectives. We have to allow Jesus only to reveal God to us, to his love, his comfort. Let's not put him into word. Let him reveal that to us. Yeah, In our relationship with God, we do not change God to fit a preference. Rather, we devote ourselves to God. We change and mold ourselves and become more like him. And become more like him. The very same purpose for which he has created us. Let us create man in our own image and in our likeness. That should be our aim. And, and, and our transformed self as we transform and experience that renewed joy of com communion with God through the Son by the Spirit. Because our transformed self then enjoys that communion with God by the Son through the Holy Spirit. Now we don't take this transformation journey alone. It's impossible for us to take. Rather, we take this journey of transformation with God in his power, in his grace, in his abilities, in his confidence, which he has revealed to us through his son, Jesus Christ. And the spirit has enabled us with that understanding. We have not seen Christ, but his spirit has revealed us to, about Christ, about the love of very God with us. Yeah. So what do we do at the cross? We bring our brokenness. We bring our brokenness to his throne and latch on to his perfect humanity as we do communion with God using Christ's perfect divinity. In our brokenness, we latch on to his perfect humanity, which then allows us to communion with God using Christ's perfect divinity. Yeah, The spirit empowers this transformation. So as we look at the cross, my family, don't stand alone. The Spirit of Christ, His very Holy Spirit will enable us to put our right focus onto Him. And as uh, Apostle Paul, uh, the, um, the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14 to 16, such an encouraging thing he says, So then, since we have a high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. Hold on to your belief. Hold on to your belief. Now this high priest of ours understand our weakness. For he faced all the same testing we do. Our God is not a foreigner God. He knows what we are going through because he has seen it. He has faced it. And yet he did not sin. So what we should do? So let us come boldly to the throne of gracious God. At the throne, we will receive his mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. At his throne, through his grace, we'll find the rest we are looking for. No worldly comfort can give us that rest to what Christ can give us through the Spirit. And now as we partake in the communion, I request all of those who have accepted Christ as their Lord and Savior to please raise them to their feet. Uh, I request uh, Manoa and uh, Dr. Elizabeth to bring forth the communion elements which they have prepared so that we can partake. I'll pray over the uh, communion elements. Then we'll uh, take the elements. Please st stay here. And post our prayer, I'll read from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 onwards. And then we'll all partake in communion. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, gracious Lord, we come before you just as we are broken, bruised, lost. In every way, O Lord. 
at your throne at the cross. So by your grace, through your strength, O Lord, we may be complete. And through your joy, our joy in this life would be complete, O Lord God. And so, o Lord, with that understanding, we'll make every effort, O Lord, to remain in communion with him. Though humanly effort fails, O Lord, but through your finished work on Christ, O Lord, that gives us hope, that gives us strength, O Lord, to come before you, our Father. Lord, we also want to thank you for Manoa and Dr. Elizabeth and the family for the uh, communion elements that they have prepared. Pray for your blessing. I pray, O Lord, that in that whole process, the heart is transformed, O Lord, as they were preparing for you. We submit ourselves and our broken self into your hand, O Lord. And as we partake, we pray for your holy presence to be with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As I read from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 onwards from the message version. Let me go over with you again exactly what goes on in the Lord's Supper and why it is so centrally important. I received my instruction from the Master himself and passed them on to you. The Master Jesus, on the night of his betrayal, took bread. Having given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's partake the bread, the body of Christ broken for us. And after su su supper, he did the same thing with the cup. And he said, the cup is my blood, my new covenant with you. This cup is my blood, my new covenant with you. Each time you drink this cup, remember me. Let's partake the cup, the blood of Jesus that was shed for us. Then he goes on to say, what you must solemnly realize is that every time you eat this bread and every time you drink this cup, you reenact in your words and actions the death of the master. You will be drawn back to this meal again and again until the master returns. Let's pray. Oh Lord, what a privilege that we in our brokenness, can still come in communion with you through the finished work of Christ and by the Spirit. O oh Lord, your very presence reside in us and transform us, O oh Lord, so that we can put that sin that creates a gap in us and you, we can destroy that with your power of our Father. What a privilege, O oh Lord, to come in your presence and to enjoy your endless grace and mercy so that we don't deserve but it is your grace O lord so we thank you in jesus name we pray amen please sit down jesus told his listeners if the son sets you free you will be free indeed in john chapter 8 verse 36 ultimately those who follow Jesus will be freed from the greatest enslavement and fear of all, the death. And as we look unto that cross, let's remind ourselves that Jesus has destroyed death by giving us a promise of immortal life.